So uh, welcome uh, everyone to our, um, our our session in machine learning and data management. Uh, to, today we have a great line of speakers that uh, ranging from topics about automatic machine learning, uh, model agnostic measures, uh, and uh, so forth and more. And so, uh, uh, but before I really get into uh, and start uh, our first speaker and introduce our first speaker, I'd like to first highlight our sponsors for, uh, for the day is uh, RStudio, and the sponsor for the session is uh, Bemberge. So uh, if you have a chance to thank them, uh, please do so. <laughs> All right. OK, so uh, with that, uh, we'll get started. And so our first speaker is uh, Alex, and he's a, um, uh, he's a data scientist in uh, Germany. And he studied mathematics, and he has a master's degree in data science. And today, he will talk about um, automating machine learning in R using uh, this uh, package called MLR3 AutoML. Uh, and with that, uh, please welcome Alex. Yeah, hello everyone. Welcome to my presentation on MLR3 AutoML. This is a package for automated machine learning in R. And this work uh, was done during my master's thesis, uh, which was supervised by Bernd Bischel and Martin Binder. And you can find the code along with all the documentation and examples on this link. I also shared it in Slack. So um, yeah, please feel free to check it out. Um, yeah, the, the name is quite long. I know MLR3 auto ML. So let me break it down. Uh, the first part is MLR3. And maybe some of you are already familiar with this. This is a powerful object oriented and extensible framework for machine learning. Hence the name machine learning in R, and it provides a really nice and rich package ecosystem, which has a lot of tools for machine learning that you can use to build all kinds of applications. Uh, for example, an AutoML framework. Um, here in the bottom of slide one, we have a picture of all the different components that are included in MLR3. I won't go into detail on in all of them, but just to give some brief overview. You have tools for tuning different uh, machine learning algorithms. You have all kinds of utilities. You can build machine learning pipelines and so on. So it's really uh, nice. And yeah, I encourage everyone to check out MLR3. Second part of the name MLR3 AutoML is AutoML. So a few words on what is AutoML and what is it good for. Uh, in general, it deals with automating machine learning workflows this could be, for example, pre-processing, model selection, hyperparameter tuning, anything that you need to go from a raw data set to a tuned machine learning model. Um, so it can uh, serve different purposes. I see two very nice use cases for this. On one hand, if you're an experienced machine learning practitioner, it can give you a very nice baseline model with almost no effort. So all you do is plug in your data set and you get some reasonable baseline, more or less a lower bound for the performance of machine learning on your data set. Or maybe if you're starting your machine learning journey, it can also help you build your first model because uh, the AutoML tool will avoid a lot of the common pitfalls. There are many different approaches how to solve the AutoML yeah, task and we decided to use the combined algorithm selection and hyperparameter optimization paradigm, which is explained in the image on slide two. So on the left-hand side, we see a machine learning pipeline with some different pre-processing operators for factor encoding, also PCA. And we also have different machine learning algorithms like GLMnet, support vector machine and gradient boosting. And now finding the optimal model uh, has basically two parts. First is uh, which operators should be in this pipeline. And second, what should the hyperparameters be? And we see this encoded in the search space here on the right-hand side. So for all the machine learning, machine learning operators, we have categorical parameters. Um, for example, encoding is a categorical parameter, either one hot or impact or learning algorithms. We have three different options, GLMnet, support vector machine, and boosting. Uh, this is just an example. 
And we also see associated to the boosting uh, different uh, hyperparameters for this as well. For example, the number of boosting iterations. So in general, we have a large search space, which is also nested. And the AutoML uh, problem boils down to optimizing or tuning over this large, large search space. I will spend a bit more time later explaining how we do this. Okay, so MLR3 AutoML, now we're bringing it together, uh, is an AutoML package for regression and classification, and it uses, it uses different components from MLR3. So we have first some automatic, automatic pre-processing using MLR3 pipelines. We also include some uh, very well-tested learning algorithms. I will explain in more detail what those are later. And the pipeline and model hyperparameters are optimized jointly, just as I explained on the previous slide, uh, using the hyperband algorithm. And we additionally include a portfolio of known good pipelines. So these are hyperparameter configurations where we've seen in our benchmarks good performance previously. But to go into a bit more detail on how the tuning works in MLR3 AutoML, um, we have two steps. First, we start by evaluating the hyperparameter configurations from the fixed portfolio. Um, so these are eight simple models that are evaluated sequentially, uh, just to give a very rough baseline uh, on even the most uh, challenging data sets where you cannot train a very complex model. And after this tuning, uh, this uh, portfolio, if there's still budget or time left to do some, some further evaluations, we continue the tuning with the hyperband algorithm. Hyperband is a multi-fidelity approach that speeds up random search and it's based around a budget parameter. So this controls how long the evaluation of a single uh, hyperparameter configuration takes. In our case, we use subsampling right here. So in the beginning, we train lots of different models on small subsets of the data, which is reasonably fast. And then as the tuning progresses, uh, we move to, towards larger subsets of the training data, um, but training fewer algorithms. And this tuning procedure is depicted uh, in this bottom illustration on slide four. So on the left-hand side, we see a graph where we have the cost function depending on the hyperparameter configuration on the y-axis and on the x-axis, we have the training budget. And in this example, we see eight different hyperparameter configurations that are trained. And uh, at the start of the tuning, we start with a low budget. So let's say a subsampling rate of 12.5% of the full data set and we evaluate all eight hyperparameter configurations and get some associated uh, cost measure for, the, for those. And yeah, the general procedure now is to discard the worst performing ones. So these four hyperparameter configurations with the highest uh, cost are discarded and the remaining half are evaluated again, uh, evaluated again on a larger subset of the training data, which we see here. And yeah, this procedure is now iterated. We discard the worst half of the hyperparameter configurations, continue training the better half on a larger budget until only one hyperparameter configuration is left. Um, this whole procedure is then uh, iterated over different starting configurations. And this is uh, shown here on the right-hand table. So we have different brackets where we have a different number of starting configurations and slightly different setups for the budget. And in general, hyperband is not only for this AutoML project. You can use MLR3 hyperband as a plugin for basically any tuning scenario that you have in MLR3. And this is all the time I have today for the background. Let's look at some examples. Our first example is how to use MLR3 AutoML in general. So we have this AutoML interface function, which has one required argument, a training task. So if you're familiar with MLR3, this is basically a wrapper around a data set and could be a regression or classification task. Afterwards, all you have to do is train your model 
And once this is finished, you can predict on some unseen data. Uh, the AutoML interface function comes with different customization options, which I will explain in more detail. Um, so you have, for example, a runtime. Uh, you can set a custom performance measure to optimize for. You can select different learning algorithms. You can influence the type of pre-processing that is happening and also add some additional parameters. So yeah, let's look at another example where we add some custom learners and the runtime budget. In this example, I use the empty cars data set, which is for regression. And I use some regression learners, so a random forest from the ranger package and some linear models. We can set the learner timeout to 10 seconds. So this means every single hyperparameter configuration, um, the training is stopped after 10 seconds. And overall, the runtime is kept at 300 seconds. So after 300 seconds, tuning is stopped. And yeah, just as before, then we can train, predict, and so on. The default MLR3 AutoML ships with uh, uh, the Ranger implementation of a random forest. We have a gradient boosting from the XGBoost package and logistic and support vector regression from the liblinear package. And these algorithms showed very stable performance for us on a variety of data sets, also provided good coverage. So more or less, most data sets should be, should be handled well. But if you're not happy with those three, you can input any learner from MLR3 or the extension packages, which should give you access to most common machine learning algorithms. Yeah, as I explained, you can set timeouts. And one other nice aspect is that the learners are encapsulated in separate R sessions, which means that if you train 20 different models, if one of them fails, this won't affect the other 19, uh, which is very important for the stability of the system. Second example, I will skip for the sake of time, but uh, just briefly, uh, you can add your own parameters to the search space and also transform them using arbitrary functions. And all the learners that are included in MLR3 AutoML also come with a predefined parameter space. And yeah, the last example that I have for today is how to influence the pre-processing. So out of the box, MLR3 AutoML comes with three predefined pre-processing settings. You have no pre-processing if your data set is already sufficiently pre-processed. You have the stability option, which deals with missing data, with numerical columns, high cardinality features, basically anything that could lead to a failure in the learning algorithms. And you have the full pre-processing option, which adds tunable imputation methods, tunable factor encoding methods, and a PCA for dimensionality reduction. As an alternative, you can also provide your own custom graph object. So basically write your own pre-processing pipeline. And this is shown in the code sample here in slide eight. So using the MLR3 pipelines package, I'm creating a pipeline here for a fictional imbalanced classification task. So we use a pipe operator for imputation, then add a pipe operator for minority oversampling using this mode algorithm and also some class weights. But yeah, now uh, you are, you can basically create any pre-processing pipeline that you can imagine here and pass this in uh, as the pre-processing argument to our AutoML interface. Okay, yeah, that's all the examples that I brought for today. And last question I want to highlight is how well does it work in practice? We evaluated this on the AutoML benchmark which consists of 39 very challenging classification tasks. And in terms of the time budget, we chose a very constrained time budget of 10 minutes for the small tasks and one hour otherwise, everything larger than 10,000 observations. But a more extensive benchmark is also currently on the way and we're curious to see what the results will be. Um, the other AutoML frameworks that we benchmarked against were AutoGluon Tabular, AutoSQLearn and H2O AutoML, as well as Teapot. And in this small benchmark, the winning framework was AutoGlue and Tabular. Um, the performance of MLR3 AutoML was slightly worse. So we see on average, the AUC on binary classification task is 1.1% less. And for multi-class tasks, we have a mean accuracy, which is 2.8% below the winning framework, AutoGlue and Tabular. But I want to highlight that MLR3 AutoML was also the only uh, library 
other than autoglue and tabular who could finish all the tasks on time without failures. Um, so this shows that while the performance might not quite be uh, at state-of-the-art levels, it's still a very nice and stable and can handle any data set you throw at it. Um, yeah, and lastly, I just want to give a shout out to everyone in the open source community. So thanks to the team uh, in OpenML, to the R Foundation, and to everyone who's contributing to MLR or MLR3. If you want to try out the project, here's a link to the GitHub. And again, it's also in the Slack. If you want to keep in touch, uh, it's easiest to reach me on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Thanks, uh, Alex, for this uh, nice presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a couple questions um, that we'd like to um, share. The, the first question is, can this package run, run on multiple, multiple cores uh, or on like a cluster system? Mm -hmm. So in general, MLR3 supports parallelization with the future backend. Uh, so you can do this. There are some limitations, though, uh, because of the hyperband algorithm is in its nature sequential. So you might start with nine uh, hyperparameter configurations to begin with, which are evaluated in parallel. But uh, if one of them takes very long, you might have to wait uh, until this one finishes before the next uh, stage starts. So there's some limitations with this. But yeah, in general, we support parallelization. OK, awesome. Uh, the next question was, uh, is the rationale be behind the timeouts? Could you explain a bit more about um, how it's how the um, this framework decides when to time out and finish on time? Because I think that's one of the key advantages of this, uh, this package. Mm -hmm. So if you don't provide any settings, um, this timeout or this timeout is basically infinite. So you will have the uh, hyperband decide when to end the the tuning. Um, but you can set, of course, a timeout for some overall time. If you say, for example, my system should run for five hours or something like this, you can put this in. And you have the individual learner timeouts um, because sometimes you might have a situation where one of the learning algorithms is not super well behaved and might take forever, for example, and we want to avoid this. So um, this is why we have timeouts for individual learners as well, where you can set, let's say, 10% uh, of your overall time or something like this. And after this, uh, stop the evaluation of, of any single learner. This is so we can um, yeah, cancel learners that, that take too long. Uh, do you think it's possible, like uh, with a follow-up question, do you think it's possible to uh, predict a, uh, a good timeout? Right, because there's there's always going to be a, a trade-off between like waiting a little bit more to find the the, the best hyperparameter, for example, mm -hmm. and f uh, there will be a certain point where there's the expectation of reaching that decreases, right? So, mm -hmm. did you think? Uh, what, what do you? What are your thoughts on that? I I know that there are some AutoML frameworks that do things like this. So, for example, they perform some polynomial regression based on some very simple features just to predict some order of magnitude for the runtime. Mm -hmm. um, this is possible, um, but yeah, currently not implemented, but yeah, would be would be nice to have. Okay, awesome. Okay, so uh, with that, we're going to move on to our next speaker. So please thank um, Alex for his presentation. There's also, uh, Alex, well, <laughs> there's also some questions in the Q&A box. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, whenever you have time, um, please do, and uh, you, you may uh, feel free to answer the questions there. Mm -hmm. Sure, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, with that, we'll have our uh, next speaker. Hello, my name is Kasia Pankala, and today with my colleague, Kasia Woźnica, we would like to share with you the results of our work. We are part of MI Square Data Lab at Warsaw University of Technology. Today, we would like to present new R package, Triplet. Triplet offers model agnostic approach to compute and visualize variable importance in predictive modeling. This approach takes into account correlation structure between variables in input data. In a nutshell, Triplet is developed as a response to the challenges faced by existing variable importance techniques. As the package name suggests, this 
chart is composed of three components. Together, they summarize correlation structure and variable importance. What is worth highlighting is that triplot is not a related tool, but is the part of Dalek universe. Dalek is a bunch of explainable model analysis tools developed by our research group. Let's start with a brief reminder of what problem we are addressing. Principle of predictive modeling is simple. On the base on input data, we would like to predict expected output. This output might be different depending on the application. For instance, it may be probability of customers default in credit scoring, price of apartment in considered location, or many different applications. On the other hand, input are variables connected with expected output, providing supplementary information. This may be information about a applicant age, his income, or or credit history in the case of credit scoring. In classical predictive modeling, input features are stored in tabular data. The relationship between descriptive variables and expected output may be very complex and difficult to capture for human perception. So we use machine learning models, black box tools. They are very effective in finding this relationship, but uh, it is hard to summarize how model works and why make this decision. This is why, in the recent years, a bunch of explainable artificial intelligence methods have been developed. XIY methods provide insight into machine learning models and try to summarize the de dependency between explanatory variables and model output. The examples of these techniques are partial dependency profile and or variable importance. But very important information which these techniques ignore is internal structure of input data, correlation between columns. In real world, variables are not independent entities. Often subset of them describe the same phenomenon from different perspectives, for example, how rich customer is. So it is natural that these variables are correlated. This dependency influences model process and XIY methods try to eliminate bias caused by correlation. In triplet package, we would like to reinforce XIY interference by adding information about correlation structure as input to explanation methods. In this presentation, we will focus on variable importance methods. For every single variable, we want to attribute how much model performance depends on this feature. To assess this, we perturb input data and create new observation in which we try to imitate excluding the impact of considered feature. After perturbation, we check how model performance has changed. The most common perturbation is permutation. We break dependency between variable and target variable. So we permutate one selected column and check how much model performance changed. We repeat this many times to estimate expected change of model performance. In a result, we can assess this, uh, the importance of, for every feature and summarize uh, of which feature caused the biggest disturbances in model predictions. This method is model agnostic and straightforward, but there are some challenges. This approach doesn't work in the case of correlation between explanatory variables. If we treat every variable independently and permute them separately, column by column, we may create a very unlikely new observation out of input data distribution. It is easy to understand uh, on the example of two uh, skill of soccer player, dribbling and ball control. Lehman would say that they are highly correlated and if player is good at dribbling, he is also able to control ball. And we could, can observe this uh, in real data. If we permute uh, ball control uh, column independently, we could create strange player with high value of dribbling, but low value of ball control. In this region of data, model may be unstable and provide out-of-range predictions because it has no observation during training model. We can mitigate the problem caused by correlated variables by using variable importance for groups. Let's look again at the football player's example. If we permute variables dribbling and ball control together, we can rest assured that we won't receive a pair of data points that will be out of the distribution. Permuting correlated features together and assessing the importance of the whole groups of variables may provide more concise explanations and more truthful picture. But what if we don't know the internal data structure that well? 
Well, let's look at it this way. It's relatively easy to use variable importance on correlated variables when there is only a pair or two pairs of them. But what if the internal structure is much more complex? If strongly correlated features create multiple interrelated groups? In that case, defining such groups is not trivial. For that task, we can use a dendrogram, that is a diagram that shows hierarchical clustering of correlated variables. This facilitates making decisions about the number and composition of groups that will be used in variable importance calculations. But then the question still remains. At what cutoff point should we calculate the variable importance? How the variable importance looks like when calculated for five groups of strongly correlated variables? And how does it look like when it is calculated for only three groups of little less correlated variables? We can try to do it by trial and error, and for different cutoff points calculate variable importance. But, well, that's created a lot of overhead. So the triplet does it for us. It takes every cutoff point from the dendrogram that is defined by the successive nodes, and it calculates the variable importance for newly created groups. And to make the picture complete, on the left, triplets show single variable importance. In that way, in one picture, we get the information about the simple variable importance. Then on the right, we can see how the data is structured. That is how variables are correlated. And in the middle, we can find out how different groups of more or less correlated variables influence the model. This is how real example of triplet looks like for a simple model. Again, single variable importance on the left, the correlation structure on the right, and hierarchical var variable importance in the middle. For the purpose of this presentation, we are using a simple model built on Boston dataset, included in ML Bench package. This model is built on only a few features out of the dataset, namely six variables, tax rate, accessibility to highways, pupil teacher ratio, percentage of lower status of the population, average number of rooms and racial proportions. Okay, let's understand how the triplet works by building it. On the left, we see single variable importance for every feature. Now, let's make the rest of the chart step by step. We start by looking at the variables tax and rad. Thanks to the dendrogram, we can see that the correlation between tax and rad is the strongest. Importance of this group is equal to almost four. Second part of correlated features is LSTAT and RM. Importance of group that consists of this feature is equal to almost 11. Next, we see that when we add PT ratio to tax and rat, we get a correlation equal to 0.3. And again, thanks to the chart in the middle, we see that importance for this three elements group is equal to five. Finally, correlation between group LSTAT plus RM and group PT ratio tax rat is 0.11, and importance of this five elements group is equal to 12. And at the end, correlation between LSTAT plus RM plus PT ratio plus tax plus rat group and B is almost negligible. So finally, the baseline for the model is 12. Finally, we can notice or highlight the following. Even if we don't see many correlated features, we can already observe that feature importance is not additive. We can see it by looking for the most important variables, LSTAT and RM. Their single variable importance values are about eight and six, six respectively. But importance of this group is equal to less than 11. And we can clearly see it thanks to the triplet. Triplet package also provides a possibility to make a chart for local variable importance. It addresses a similar problem, how single variables influence the prediction of a given of observation. What is the correlation between variables and how groups of variables impact the prediction? It is based on, a, on an experimental method for local variable importance called predict aspects. This method is also implemented in the triplet package. At the end, we would like to show you the code that produces the triplet. You can see that after building the model, we create a Dalek explainer, uh, a useful adapter for the machine learning explanation. 
Afterwards, triplet object is built on the explainer and then plotted. To summarize, we would like to highlight the necessity of taking into account the input data correlation structure when we are building machine learning explanations. To mitigate the problem of correlation making variable importance results misleading, we can use triplet. Triplet package is available on CRAN, and more information about methods described here can be found in our preprinted paper as well as on the GitHub. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, thanks, uh, Katazerna, for a uh, nice presentation. Oh, that's, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so with that, we'll take uh, some questions. Uh, so Katazerna, are, are you there? Yes, Hel hello. Hi, awesome. So I, I have a couple of questions about uh, this, this tripod method. So it's, it's very interesting how you're addressing this question about a variable importance but instead of uh, using a more, uh, I guess, a more traditional way of looking at it, in terms of a more uh, a data science perspective, there are many variables that are correlated with each other. And accounting with, uh, taking account of that correlated structure, how can we uh, visualize and assess the uh, importance of variable, in, uh, 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 variable importance? And so I was wondering, the first question I had was related to scalability. So this is, uh, this is using permutation for uh, each variable, but in a uh, very a grouping manner, right? So if there's like five variables, then you choose two variables that have high correlation, and then you permute it uh, while preserving that correlation structure, right? And then you assess the importance of that group. Is that is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So if, in that case, then um, in in the example that we shown, I'm sure you, this example that I show was to just to illustrate the point. But if this, if we're looking at more than five variables, like let's say we're looking at 100 variables, or uh, I think a lot of this correlated structure uh, is very high in image data, and so if we apply this method. For image data, then I imagine that uh, the computational costs would be quite um, demanding. And so I was wondering, like, what are your thoughts in terms of uh, extending this approach to uh, to data sets to have more variables? Yes, that's correct. Uh, actually, we focus on the tabular data, and uh, so uh, making it work on uh, different. Uh, kind of data would be uh, computational, computational heavy and uh, because it, as you said, uh, it uh, calculates the feature importance for every newly created uh, uh, group of features. So uh, at some point when we are uh, getting the bigger and bigger data set, uh, it does take some time to, to calculate the, the whole triplet. Uh, so at some point we need to uh, uh, decide how many, uh, how many, because the um, this is calculated by using the subset of the data. So at some point we need to uh, very carefully consider how to uh, choose the parameters for those uh, computations. Uh, Ashu, would you like to add something to that? I totally agree with you because uh, if we consider uh, more variables, we create more groups and it will be, uh, I think that uh, this uh, may be computational heavy because of uh, this new created aspects. Uh, uh, so we would like, um, we may think about uh, uh, creating some penalization uh, during the creating uh, groups, but we need to uh, think about it. There, there's a related question here um, that asks, again, for large data sets, uh, hacker clustering can be unstable. I think this means in terms of this very uh, greedy algorithm manner that you're just grouping two variables that have high correlation and so forth. And in terms of large data sets, that might not lead to uh, the optimal solution in terms of grouping variables. Have you any, have you, do you have any like, thoughts on elaborating different approaches in terms of grouping variables? Uh, yes. So, 
uh, in general, we are thinking about extending our approach uh, and uh, not using only the hierarchical clustering, but also some other methods. And uh, what we would also like to approach is to give the possibility for the user to use uh, the user-defined uh, methods. So, because what we are really looking here, we are looking here for the order in which the variables are joined into the groups and what, at what at what points they, they are joined. So uh, the, our idea for next experiments with this package is to provide the way for the user to uh, to define the to define it to define the uh, grouping methods uh, the or the measure uh, that would be uh, used for uh, building uh, such a uh, such a tree, such a that uh, yes. Yeah. Um, I think it's so I think it's a very uh, interesting point that the tripod is addressing, and it. Um, I think one thing I, mean, it, I think in some sense the tripod is a very extensive uh, approach, and it looks at every uh, based on the grouping um, algorithm. It looks at every single. Uh, subgroup structure of the data. But in, in reality, depending on the what you're predicting or what your class, the objective of the machine learning algorithm, I think there might be some uh, uh, groups, groups that are more informative than others. And maybe by developing some, uh, some algorithm that strategically chooses which group to focus more on, and put, uh, I think that would also be interesting to see uh, in the future. Um, in terms of scalability, that would definitely uh, sorry, scale. Yeah. Yes, okay. that would help, exactly. That would support the calculate, calculations of the triplet on the uh, bigger data sets, for sure. Okay, um, all right, so uh, with that, we'll move on to the next speaker. Please thank uh, Katja Zerna, uh, both Katja Zernas, uh, for their uh, nice presentation. And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we uh, are moving on to our third talk. Hello everybody, my name is Jonathan Bourne. Um, I'm a PhD student at UCL studying complex networks and their relationship to cascading failures on the power grid. Um, during my PhD, I developed the strain elevation tension spring embedding algorithm, also known as SETSI, and am the author and maintainer of RSETSI on CRAN. So what is an embedding? Um, I like to think of embeddings as, uh, as a way of representing data, which is more useful for a specific purpose than the original representation. And so to give you an example of that, we've got this MNIST data set, which are the numbers zero to nine, handwritten uh, by a lot of different people, and uh, two different uh, ways of embedding data. Um, MNIST is a matrix of, I think, uh, 64 or 128 uh, points, and uh, it can be embedded using any kind of tabular uh, method. So we've got principal component analysis, a common statistical data uh, compression and, and, and embedding method, and TSNE, which is uh, T-distributed stochastic neural embeddings, which is a nonlinear approach. And what you know the task in this case we're saying is okay we want to be able to move all the similar numbers together so all the zeros class together all the ones class together all the twos class together and we want to do that in a two-dimensional space and what you can see is that the non-linear approach of tsne although um unsupervised really does manage to uh do this itself and and group those similar numbers together in, in an unsupervised way and so for this purposes this embedding is more useful because we want to be able to see things that are similar close together than the original representation and so uh graph embeddings are the same but for the irregular structures of graphs and there are two um different sort of main families here. There's uh, those embedding methods which are good for visualization, but not very useful for analytical insight. And those which are good for analytical, in analytical insight, but uh, less valuable for um, uh, visualization. And, and Setsi uh, takes techniques employed by the visualization methods, but um, manages to uh, use this for analytical insight. So it's kind of a hybrid of the two. And, and what is our SETSI? You know, well, our SETSI is a physics-based deterministic uh, graph embedding algorithm 
um, that represents a network as a system of springs um, where the edges are springs and the node features are forces. Um, and it tries to position the nodes such in embedded space that the forces on the nodes are cancelled by the forces on the springs and the system is in a, in a state of equilibrium. Um, so how does it do this? So the easiest way to think about this is looking at the image on the on the left, uh, which is a uh, one-dimensional embedding. So you could consider that uh, a network which only has one variable on the node. So that may be um, age or amount of money or something like this, or it could be a binary variable such as you are a member of group A or you are a member of group B. And so Setsi lays out the, the, the graph in some sort of plane, uh, graph space, and the nodes are free to move in the one-dimensional case up and down. So they effectively, they act like beads on a rod. And the nodes, two nodes that are connected to each other are separated by some distance D. And the equilibrium state is found when the elevation of the node, hence Setsi, the elevation of the node um, is uh, such that you get this equilibrium. So in higher dimensions, like this two-dimensional example on the right, the uh, nodes become disks that move on parallel planes, and then you can keep adding dimensions as you wish. So this is a very simple example. It's a, a network of two groups, group A and group B, where group B has a positive force and group A has a negative force. So we'll, group A will move down into the screen and group B will move back out of the screen. And, uh, or attempt to anyway, the, um, the sum of the forces in each group both add to one and minus one respectively. So group B adds up to one, meaning it's a, it's a force of one third on each node and group uh, A adds up to minus one. So it's a group force of minus 0.25 on each node. So what then happens is um, although each node is free to move on its own, any displacement from the initial plane causes the uh, springs to stretch in accordance with Hooke's law. This generates a force. And when the sum of the forces attached to each node are equal and opposite to the force exerted by the node itself, and this is the case for all nodes in the network, then you have an equilibrium. So you, you, you move the nodes to those certain position, each node has an elevation, the uh, springs are extended, this creates a strain and a tension, elevation, tension, strain, whatever, <laughs> and um, this uh, gives you your final embedded values. Um, one thing that's quite interesting to look at is, in this case, the movement of the nodes as they move up and down and heading towards convergence. In this case, we can see the image on the right has the movement patterns of or the elevation patterns across time um, for each of the nodes. And what we can see is that nodes A, B and C have the same convergence pattern and nodes uh, G and F have the same convergence pattern. And this is because these nodes have the same relationship to each other as uh, they do to the rest of the network. So they're structurally identical within the network. So they act in the same way. We can also see that the group A nodes, which is A, B, C, and D, all have their final value below the initial plane. So they have a uh, negative uh, embedding. And uh, the group B nodes are above that. And this is expected because one has negative force and one has positive force. So what can you use Setsi for? Well, you can use it for quite a lot of different things. Uh, the original purpose was for uh, understanding more about the robustness of networks under targeted attack. Um, but here we can see five networks which represent Peel's Quintet. And Peel's Quintet is a family of five different networks which are structurally clearly quite dif different but have identical statistical properties. Um, and so they're in many ways quite similar to Anscombe's Quartet, uh, which I'm sure you're aware of is a, is a collection of four different figures, which look very different, but have identical correlation, mean, uh, number, and so on. 
And so the task with Peel's Quintet is whether a graph embedding algorithm can distinguish between these different families. So what I did in my first paper was I generated 100 examples of each of the Peel's Quintet types and embedded them into two-dimensional space uh, using various different embedding methods. And as you can see, SETI in the lower right-hand corner was very, very good at separating out these families. So we embedded them at network level, took averages, and, and then saw what we got out. And SETI uh, has almost perfect separation. There is a little bit of mixing up going on between groups A and B, but um, overall, uh, very, very effective. But SETSI works not only at, at network level, like the previous slide, but also at node level. And so one of the things about Peel's Quintet is it's got these two groups, group A and group B, but it also has subgroups, A1 and A2. And so embedding the networks at group level, A and B, SETSI automatically distinguishes or, or, or separates in, in the embedded space out. Um, the different subfamilies. And you can see these patterns emerging quite clearly at, um, at node level. So this image is, is actually one of the original uses of, of SETSI and one of the reasons I created it, which was to look at the robustness of power grids under random attack. And what we can see in the lower right-hand corner is that the tension element of, uh, of SETSI, so that is the spring tension uh, when the network is embedded is a very good predictor of the robustness of a, of a network during uh, when it's under attack. And we can see that other network embedding methods were not uh, quite as uh, effective. So um, SETSI can also analyze social relations and social networks. In this image, uh, the historical conflict in which the Medici family took over uh, Renaissance Florence uh, is reenacted with different levels of importance laid on interfamily marriage and business relationships. Uh, the figure shows how the Medici's uh, skillful network positioning uh, allowed them uh, and, and use of marriage allowed them to uh, take over Renaissance Florence. As a final example, um, we can see here Setsi used in mapping and this is very nice because it shows really what SETSI does. So although SETSI embeds a network on a high dimensional manifold, um, it, it's really a kind of network smoothing mechanism. So it smooths the node features uh, of the irregular structure of a network. And this allows you to create quite nice maps. And these maps, uh, if you look on the elevation and tension uh, facets, uh, they actually tell you quite a lot about you know, population, and in this case, power generation, where people are living, where power is being generated, and can actually provide quite useful qualitative insight into um, what a network is doing when it's embedded in a geographical space. So R -C, um has been implemented in R, unsurprisingly. Uh, that's why I'm here. And, um, it's uh, got a whole load of documentation for you to check out, and it's available on CRAM, which makes it nice and easy to install on your computer. Uh, when you look at our set team, when you install it, there's uh, five different uh, sets of functions. It can seem a bit daunting, but really three of them do the same thing. Um, they automatically choose your hyperparameters to ensure a very uh, quick and, and effective embedding so uh, these are the auto functions, auto, auto high dimensional, or the bi connected component, which does a kind of a cheeky way, which can be faster in, in certain circumstances. So uh, what you do with those is it, it selects set hyperparameters, which gives you this very smooth, very fast embedding that you can see on the right in the line in purple and prevents divergence, which is the uh, line in red or, or the slower uh, types of convergence. So the package is fully documented uh, to make sure that you know you can get to grips with simple examples of sets and get your head around what sets it means, and then focus on um, embedding your own data and understanding what your own data can tell you instead of worrying about uh, confusing code. So in summary, 
um, sets is a physics-based uh, deterministic graph embedding algorithm. It can predict at node and network level. It's implemented in R in the R SETSI package available from CRAN. Um, and there's a detailed uh, documentation and vignettes available for you. So if you want to find out more about SETSI, um, look uh, my paper, The Spring Bounces Back, which is uh, available in Applied Networks, or I have a preprint on high tension called High Tension Lines, uh, which is available on Archive. You've also got the website, the documentation website, or just install Arsetsi using install packages, Arsetsi, and uh, have a play around. So I'd like to thank uh, the EPRSC International Doctoral Scholars IDS grant for funding my PhD, the UCL Myriad High Performance Computing Facility, uh, for making a lot of the calculations uh, possible, and the UCLR user group who uh, funded me to come to this uh, conference. So thank you very much to everyone and thank you very much for your time. Goodbye. Okay, awesome. Thank you uh, for your uh, nice talk uh, on, uh, regarding Setsi. Uh, so we have a couple of questions here. Uh, the first question is, how does SESI scale with, with the size of the network? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. And um, uh, there's a bit more detail in the in the Spring Bounces Back paper, but uh, roughly in terms of uh, time complexity, it's uh, quadratic. So uh, it scales quadratically uh, with the number of nodes, although this is a bit like dependent on the actual structure of the network. So one of the functions I mentioned was the uh, SETSI BICOMP. And what this does is, where possible, it breaks the network up into small independent sub-networks, solve those, and then puts it back together. And so, depending on your network structure, uh, generally it's, it's faster, but it can, uh, depending on your network structure, be dramatically faster, because essentially you could break down, say, a network of, uh, I don't know, 10,000, 20,000 nodes into, you know, uh, 5,000 uh, networks of, of four nodes or something like that, which should be extraordinarily fast uh, relatively. Um, and in terms of memory complexity, it's linear and it uses very, very little memory to run. So you can actually solve quite large networks on, um, <coughs> sorry, on quite a, quite a small computer. Um, so I think, oh, I can't remember now, but I think when I was solving a network with about 40,000 nodes and one and a half million edges, I think that took about four hours, which is not hugely fast, uh, four hours, and uh, but only used like 300 megs of RAM. So you can run things quite in, in quite parallel if you've got a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, networks to solve. Uh, it, with a just a follow-up question with that is, does that mean that the algorithm will, um, the performance of the algorithm may de depend on the, how SETC uh, breaks down the network? So yeah. are you like identifying like the community structures of it? And identifying the community structure itself could also be a uh, high time uh, consuming part as well, right? Yeah, so I mean, SETSI doesn't look for the SETSI in a way it, it can be used as a community uh, detection algorithm, like you saw when uh, I was embedding Peel's Quintet at node level, effectively it discovered these hidden communities uh, within the network. But um, what a bi-connected network is, is essentially if you have two clusters of nodes, or, or a network, but the, the network can be cut into two by slicing through a single node, that node is, is a bi-connecting point. And so where the network can be cut into separate pieces with a single cut, right. that's what SETSI looks for. So that's, a, that's a, a standard algorithm that you can use and you can just separate networks into their, into their sub-components, sub-bi-connected components. And when a network has that structure, which most networks do, um, you can solve them, you can solve this sort of by piecemeal approach, you solve all these smaller parts of a network, and then you reassemble it into the um, overall embedded structure. So it's only looking at these, uh, these single, not singletons, but these uh, bi-connecting nodes? 
when you use the bi connected network version, but that you, you may not want to. I mean, generally speaking, um, for one dimensional or binary embeddings, yeah, use that, but um, you, you may not want to. So there's a couple of different different versions available depending on, on what the use case is. I see. Uh -huh. Uh, the the other question that I uh, that, well I, I had was um, so I've also been using a lot of these uh, network uh, these softwares uh, in, in my analysis and uh, often I found that using R like since we're in this R conference um, I mean there are packages that are, that help that sort of uh, help network analysis. Um, but was there a reason why you chose to implement your method using R? Um, you um, more mostly because right? that's what I program in, right? But, um, yeah, you know, I use the uh, iGraph package a lot. And I think iGraph yeah, is a I really, really, um, really, really fast, you know, generally speaking, it's, it's, it's as closely possible wrapped around C++. So, you know, it's, uh, it's as lightweight as it can be and then tries to do all the heavy lifting in C++. That's, it's also got an... Um, uh, a Python implementation. Um, but I think, you know, that, and, and so that's really why, and I actually, you know, really the big package on Python, I think is Network X. Um, and obviously I'm more, you know, an R person, but I prefer the way iGraph works um, to the way Network X works, and that, that could be subjective. Um, and so that's really why um, our uh, SETI was implemented in, in in uh, in our, I mean, I should I should mention actually, just as a bit of an aside, I should mention that although this is the machine learning section, you know, yeah. it's kind of controversial whether SETI is actually machine <laughs> learning, right? Because it's a deterministic yeah. algorithm, right? You know, and it, it actually doesn't use statistical inference. You know, it uses uh, physical laws. So, is it machine learning? Is is difficult, but really the reason I'm here is because every single other algorithm that it's comparable to is a machine learning algorithm. So the ones I compare against are like Notovec, which is a kind of word to vec variant for graphs, or you've got DGI, which is, uh, you know, a deep learning approach and all of the techniques to do with uh, graph embedding and really all of the modern embedding techniques are machine learning techniques. And I think one of the things that's interesting about sets is that even though it's technically dumb, right? It does, it, it's, it's not an intelligent system. Actually, it can find really quite nuanced and complex structures within, uh, within these algorithms, uh, within these uh, networks in very, very low dimensional space. And so I think um, even if it isn't machine learning algorithm itself, it, it can act like one and it can also act as the a sort of um, input to other uh, machine learning uh, systems. Yeah, so I, I have a little bit different take on it. So I think a lot of complex networks, I mean, so I don't know how many people in this audience knows much about complex networks, but I think after Jonathan, I think I might know a bit more about it, but it's it's mostly based on uh, its uh, statistical physics. So that's, so I think it, in that perspective, so of course, this uh, the approach that you take in is, uh, is somewhat unique, but the whole, the field in itself is sort of grown in a statistical physics type of area. And in that sense, you know, we could say that uh, it's related to statistics, maybe not traditional, traditional statistics that we know with like p-values and so forth. And the other thing is that this is the, the um, I think what's nice about a lot of these uh, machine learning algorithms is not necessarily about the pedigree of where it's originated, but more about the goal of the, 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 the problem. And here, I think what Sessi is doing is doing something very similar to a lot of uh, dimension reduction algorithms and applying that there. So in that sense, I think, you know, I think you you fit perfectly fine here. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure in the audience, there are there will be audiences who are unfamiliar with this uh, graph structure. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think I think I, I've, I really enjoyed your talk and I look forward to uh, your next projects and so forth. Okay, we were a little bit over time, so I'm going to, so please thank Jonathan for his uh, nice talk in complex networks and graph embeddings. All right, so that's uh, the end of the session in uh, machine learning and data management. I think, uh, I think one thing for sure, I think there's many different areas that um, 
that maybe might be unfamiliar with uh, some of the people in the audience, but I think what's, what's very clear is that uh, there's many things that you could do with R. <laughs> you could do auto ML, you could do feature selection, uh, you could use network analysis, and then also if you're interested in studying economics, then uh, there's also uh, work that is being done here. And so I think uh, if there's one take home message, I think uh, it's very clear that the R uh, community is, uh, is, is growing. And um, thank you all for joining us. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>